Today we're gonna jump ahead to chapter nine and collaborate with GitHub. So last week we were collaborating with ourselves on GitHub, which is super powerful, but being able to include other people in a repository and have them working on the same project that you are is one of the like most powerful things about GitHub. What we're gonna do today is collaborate with a partner in kind of the, the simplest way which is to give them the same permissions that you have so that both of you are able to edit and add, it, add files to a repository. There's a whole series of other ways to limit people's permissions so that you have to sort of manage who's able to contribute at what time, but we're not gonna get into that yet because I think the way, the way we work as a Ocean Health Index team is we, everybody has the same permissions and I think a lot of the projects that we'll be working, you'll be working with as scientists will also have that kind of collaboration where you can all have the same permissions. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be working on a website with our collaborator. So we're going to actually have you guys partner up. At the beginning we're going to have both of you looking at one person's computer for a little bit and then we'll switch back to everybody working on their own computers. So I'll be partner one and Melanie will be partner two as we Demo, demo this and then you guys can do it at the same time along with us. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is again written in, in the book, so I'm going to be using these notes as we, as I go through teaching all of this. But what we're going to do first of all is partner one is going to create a repository on github.com. So I'm going to go to github.com to my username. I'm going to go to the repositories and have a new repository. And I'm going to call this collaborative website for, for the name of my repository for now. And I'm going to say I'm learning to collaborate, Oops, collaborate with GitHub. I'll keep it public. I'll initialize it with a readme and I'll just go ahead and create the repository now. Just one partner is creating this. By default, a repository that you make has a master branch, and we're not gonna talk very much about branches today, but it's another feature that GitHub has so that multiple people can work in the same space without affecting each other's work. I kind of think of them as like parallel universes, like you can make a copy of your work and then work in parallel without affecting each other. And if you ever want to merge them back into each other, GitHub will be able to do that. But otherwise, it's like a safe place to work. So usually, if you want to have another one of these branches, you can name them whatever you want. But if you name it with a very specific name, as a GH pages, it will create a website. From that branch. So that's the, that's the only reason I bring up branches is because we can name it a very specific thing to turn our repository into a website. So the way we do that, if you click here on master, you'll see that there's right now just one branch called master, but you can create a new branch. So if we create this with lowercase gh dash pages, and it has to be written just like this with lowercase and with that dash. So if I hit return now, it will create a new branch called GH Pages. And now what you can see is if I click right here on this little branch button and see that I now have two options, I've got GH Pages and Master. So that's one way I can see that I've got two branches. And the other way I can see it is over here this is somewhere we haven't looked so far. It used to say one branch and now it says two branches. We can click over there to, to manage our branches and you can see that right now master is this default branch and GH pages is another branch. We're gonna change our default branch so that it is only the GH pages branch for now. So if I click this button here as Partner one, I've got the option to, from this selector, I can switch it from master to GH pages. So I'm gonna click on GH pages and click update. 
and it's going to say, are you sure you want this? And I'm going to say, yes, I do. So now I've, now I'm back at, I've got this default branches, GH pages. I want to just go and check. So I'm going to look back again at where we came from before, which was kind of more like the code area. I can just click back here to, to go back to the main repository, which happens to be this code tab. Yeah, so you could click on code or, or you can always click on the name of the repository itself to get back where you were. And now I'm going to click on this branches. And you can see now here GH pages is the default branch. And just to clean things up as one final step here, I'm going to go ahead and delete the master branch. Just so we now will just have one branch and it's this GH pages that will let us do a website. Through the master, an HTML file will not be rendered nicely as a website. You, you have to go through an extra step to actually see it rendered. So if it's a GH pages branch, it will, GitHub will take care of rendering it nicely for you. This is like a one-time series of steps you have to do in order to turn a repository into a website. You can have multiple branches if you want. So for the Ocean Health Index, we might have the master branch where we do all of our analyses and then a GH pages branch where we make a website displaying some of those analyses, but we kind of want them in different places. So that's one way that we use multiple branches at the same time. So yeah, maybe later on, if you, if you guys wanted to add a different branch to keep something else separate, you totally could. You can sort of, it's like another way to think about organizing, not just in folders within the same universe, but you can have like this kind of parallel place that you can operate between. So now that we've got this GH Pages branch, let's go into the settings to add a collaborator. And so we can get to that right here from the settings tab. And if you're ever in a place where you don't see this option, again, go ahead and click back to the main repository, which is also the same thing as the URL at the top. So it's GitHub, my username, and then the name of the repository. So I'm gonna go to settings. And the way you add a collaborator, here's a, a little menu on the left side that says collaborators. So I can add a collaborator here and it will, even though I'm already logged in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ask me in some cases to confirm my password. Now I'm in collaborators and I'm able to add whoever I want to this repository. So partner one, why don't you add partner two? So I'm going to add Melanie. So yeah, once you add their name there, you can say add collaborator. And then it's going to say that it's awaiting this person's response. So they'll, they'll get an email alert that they've been invited to collaborate on a GitHub repository. If they, they'll then be asked to click on a link to confirm. And once they click on that link and confirm, then they will become a full collaborator. So you can see that my partner accepted and now it's no longer pending. It's, she's, a, she's a full collaborator. And by default, she has access to edit and add things to the repository and push them back. So why don't you refresh and see if, if your partners have accepted. So now we're going to have partner one clone this repository to their computer. And so we're going to do the same thing that we did last week, where we're going to copy this URL and then go to our studio. And, and clone this. So I'm gonna open our studio. And I, on a Mac, I can do that with command space. Open a session of our studio. And this is my our studio session from last week, and you might have the same thing, but that's fine. You're still able to clone a new repository from a different project from a different R Studio project. So just like last week, I can either click over here to go to new project. There's also the option of doing it up here in the file menu, say new project. So either way, we'll get you to this interface here where it says you're creating a new project. You're going to do this with version control. It's going to be Git. And then here's where you paste this repository's URL. If I press the tab key, it will auto-populate the collab website repository name. 
and I still want this to be saved here in our GitHub folder. If you're working on a server, you won't have this option, but if you're working locally on your computer, you'll have the option of opening this project in a new session, which I'll show you what that, what that looks like. Go ahead and say create project. So what this looks like for me is I've got this new R Studio session, just like we expected. I've got, it's called Collab Website, and my, the place where I am right now is actually inside this Collab Website. What happened to me when I checked that box, open this in a new session, is it, it actually created a whole new R Studio session here. So all of the work that I was in the middle of doing from last week is still here and somewhere I could come back to and come back and forth to. And this is something that I'm working on by myself, but then I could just as easily switch here to my collab website where I'm going to be collaborating with Melanie. And so it's a way that you can separate projects and actually be working in R and GitHub in two different places. Let's just look one for a second back at the website version at github.com. We've just got this one file, which is a readme here on the URL um, at github.com. But as soon as I created this project through our studio, I got these two other files, this git ignore and this dot um, r project. And these are helper files that are going to help organize and uh, the version control and sort of the R project side of things. So because they're, they've been, they were added um, when we cloned this, if we look at the Git tab, you can see that they have been added here. Well, actually, wh wh what's happening right now is that GitHub's watching this, this whole repository, and these are new things that it was not tracking before, and it's got these question marks to say, these seem new, but I'm not sure what you want me to do with them. And so when I check them, they'll understand that they've been added and I'll be able to commit these and push them back to the website. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's check them both. This is still just partner one doing this. And we're going to commit these, commit these rproj files, rproj and git ignore files. Let's go ahead and commit this. I'm gonna just go ahead and pull, because I always like to pull before I push, close. This commit is still just locally on our computer, but now when I push it, it will be pushed up to the, to github.com. If partner two did clone this already, one of the ways they can get rid of this if they're working locally is they could quit our studio, quit this session, and go to their finder or their Windows Explorer, and they could find their whole repository that they just cloned. This is in my GitHub folder called Collab Website, and they could just go ahead and, and delete it, send it to the trash, move to the trash. You're able to, to delete whole repositories just like they're any other folder on your computer. So this is another opportunity to show you that if I wanted to open this session again on my own computer, I can click it just like it's uh, any other folder. And if I double click this rproj file, it will open up our studio again. And it's, again, it's opened it in this, in its own session. So it didn't close my other project when I did that. The next thing we were going to do was to be to have partner two clone this. I'm going to have Melanie do this. Partner two is going to do the exact same thing that partner one did. So using a URL that has actually my username in it, she's going to just be able to click this URL and use our studio to clone a copy of my, my repository onto her computer. All right, I've cloned. Okay, so she's cloned. When partner two cloned, our studio would not have made any new files for her because that dot git ignore and that dot rproj already exists. Like when she pulled it, oh wait, sorry, I should, I should refresh this. So I just, I just refreshed my screen to show you what I pushed. So when Melanie pulls, she'll receive these dot git ignore and these dot rproj files. So nothing new is gonna be created by Melanie's computer. 
the Let's Have a Partner to Melanie add some information to the README. Maybe just write that you're a collaborator on this project to the README, Melanie, and then push that back. So I can show you what I'm asking her to do. She'll add to the README, maybe like collaborator and, and her name or something she's going to contribute to the, our project. Okay, so I've done that. So I'm committing now, right? Okay, yep. She's going to commit and then I'll be able to refresh and see her information. And so while, while I'm waiting, you can see that right now at a glance, the most recent thing that happened to this repository was five minutes ago and it was by me and I was committing those files. And if we looked at this commit history, you'd see these kind of two things that have happened to this repository. The first time I created it, there was a commit message that GitHub made for me. And then when I did this, it was, it shows up here. So if I go back to the main website, looks like Melanie's already pushed this. So now Melanie is the most recent thing. It happened 26 seconds ago. And this readme actually, we, we can, we can inspect it by clicking on it to see the actual file, but also github.com always displays the readme at the bottom here. So we can, we can see at a glance what this readme is and it looks like Melanie is super excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so she's just added this information and um, if we looked at this commit history now, we'll also see that she's involved here. There's a bunch of different ways to explore what has happened so far. So let's go back to the collab website. If we actually look at this README file itself, if I click on this, I could actually look at both the history of the commit history like we just saw. I could also look at this thing called blame. And this is kind of cool. This shows line by line who is responsible for the information on that line in the most recent version. So this is a way that if, if there's code that you've got a question about, you can be like, who wrote this code? Oh, right, it was me. Or you could say, oh, I, I've got a question about it. It's, you know, Melanie wrote this code. All, there's all this information that GitHub is tracking and collating for you and then presenting in, a, in different ways that you can look to understand. Let's think about Melanie and me right now. What's the state of the repository right now. So this stuff on github.com is the most recent things that have happened to this repository. So this most recent state of the repository is on github.com and it's also on Melanie's computer, right? She has the most up-to-date information, but I don't, right? I, my stuff is still before her edits to this to this readme. So if we look at my RStudio and we look at this readme, um, my version still doesn't have her information and there's not really any information telling me that there could be something out of date from github.com. So the way though to check if there is something else new is to Pull. So that's why whenever I open a new project, whenever I open this project again, like I did, or if I come back from lunch or whatever, I always pull and it will tell me that this readme had, has been changed and I can actually see behind that it was already updated. So that's great. So now I know that I'm working with, with the most recent thing. There's no cost at, involved at all of pulling. So if I'm, if I'm not sure whether that works, I can also pull and it will tell you if it's already up to date. So I think that pulling often is the way to go if you're just getting back to a project and not sure someone's collaborating on it. Pulling can also introduce merge conflicts when there's something on my local computer that's different from github.com and if I try to merge. So let me show you, let me walk you through an example between Melanie and me of a merge conflict and then we'll let you guys do this hands-on and fix the merge conflicts that have come up for you guys. Okay, so one of the reasons why I showed you this, the, that blame feature is because you know, GitHub is, is tracking information line by line so that means that if, if 
you're collaborating with somebody and you're working on totally different files, there's no problem. GitHub has no problem adding those files together. If you're working in the same file and you're working on different lines of it, like its job is to weave those lines together. So often there's not a problem. The problems come when you're working on the exact same lines. And that honestly doesn't happen that much because if you and a collaborator are working on the exact same file, potentially on the exact same lines, you'll often be talking to each other also and saying like, hey Ellie, I'm gonna be put, like, I'm working on this, can I commit and push it? Like make sure you pull before you continue or, or whatever, right? Like if you're working that closely, there'll often be communication between you and um, we do that through Slack, through Gchat, talking to each other and we still have problems, but the point of GitHub is to like weaving your work together and when it can't do that automatically without losing information, it, it asks you to make a decision so that it won't overwrite stuff. The point of it is to have you make the decisions about what work to keep and not just to make your life miserable, although sometimes merge conflicts can kind of feel like that way. <laughs> okay, so Melanie and I are gonna give you a little demonstration of what a merge conflict could be. So, so we're gonna have both Melanie and I, both partners one and two, pull so that on our, our studios, we have the most, most recent session. So right now, both of us are gonna get this already up to date because Melanie is the original person who created the most recent changes and I've already pulled it. So we're both up to date. Now, both of us are going to create a new line seven and write something, write something at all, anything at all. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write something and Melanie is gonna write something as well. And when I save it, this stops being read and shows up over here as, as a modified line. So why doesn't Melanie go ahead and commit that? She's gonna go ahead and commit her work. So she wrote this new information on line seven. She's going to stage this, commit this, and push it. And we'll be able to check. We can go to github.com and see when she's, when she's done that, I'll be able to refresh and see her updates will we'll change from being a minute, from being nine minutes ago to right now. All right, should be there. Okay, so if I refresh, I can see, cool. So Melanie is adding important information to the readme. And so now if I come here and let's see, let me see if I can pull. What would happen if I pulled right now? So if I pull, it gives me this whole, stuff about an error your local changes to the following files would be overwritten by a merge read me please commit your changes or stash them before you can merge so this makes sense right like we we know that melanie wrote something different and if and if i if this allowed me to pull it would overwrite what i just wrote locally like and we don't want that right um, so it, but it tells me, even though this looks, you know, kind of intimidating, like, wow, I don't know what all this stuff is. It's, it's giving me information. It says your local information will be overwritten this. I'm talking about the single file. Here's two things you could do. You either commit your changes or you stash them and stashing them in my understanding means like copying it somewhere else so that you have it somewhere else, but then you can overwrite it here. So it's kind of the way you would work even outside of GitHub, if you were afraid of losing something, you'd make a copy of it and stash it somewhere else. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and commit my changes. I'm gonna try the first thing. So if I close this, I'm gonna say, committing my contribution. Okay, I can close this. Okay, now, now what happens if I pull? So I've, I've got this commit message that I've, I've committed locally on my computer. It still isn't synced, but, if, let's try now. If I pull this, it's going to say, nope, there's, there's a merge conflict here. So this also makes sense, right? We expected that that wasn't going to take care of it, really, because there's still this decision about Melanie's information and my information. Like, get, I don't want GitHub to choose for me. I want to choose. But this is saying, okay, there's this conflict, like merge conflict in the README, automatic merge failed, fix the conflicts, and then commit the result. 
So if I close this, I can see a couple different things going on. First of all, this README has shown up again. It used to not be here, but it's got these two U's, which I interpret as an unmerged conflict. And my little box that I, this little box is, is um, saying that there's been changes that have happened, so it's not properly staged. Um, but also let's, let's look over here at this README. There's now way more information here, right? This is my, this is what I wrote. My, hi, this is Julie. And then this is what Melanie wrote. Hi, Julie, how are you? And this, what's going on here is that this syntax with the head and this syntax with this big long number is kind of bounding the, the places where I need to make a decision. So between these two things, I need to make a decision and this separates them. So my job right now is to choose which one of these lines I wanna keep. If I decide to keep Melanie's, then I need to delete everything that is not Melanie's line. So what that means is I need to delete all of this and delete this so that I'm just, I guess I could even, it should be on line seven. So this is just staying on line seven. So if I save this and I now can look at this commit box and here now it shows me just that I'm, this makes it look like I'm just simply deleting her line or deleting my line and adding her line. But I can say resolving merge conflict. If I commit this, it let me commit it without a problem. Let me just show you. This is now, I've got these two commits that I've got locally. I'm now gonna pull, and it says that it's already up to date, so it's, it's happy again, which is great. And then I can push, and it all is great. So let's look at github.com and see what this looks like if I refresh this again. So yeah, there's resolving merge conflicts. My commits are up to six, and you just see this most recent line that I did. So if I look at these commits, you can see that, you know, Melly added that important information. My, I committed my, com my contribution, and then I resolved this merge conflict, and we're all set. So this shows me that I deleted this. If I looked at the history, this is, this is in the history of resolving merge conflict. If I go back and look at what this contribution was of mine, if I click here, this sort of gives you, me a little bit more information is that I had to, you know, I had this strange time where I was adding both, where I had both of these at a time. It, it doesn't show that kind of head and weird syntax, but this is kind of an interim period where both things were in the same file. Yeah, if I chose the wrong one to delete, I could always go back and be like, what, what was that? So that's kind of a, an example, like a, you know, just a single line example of a merge conflict. Sometimes you might have multiple places within a file that both of you have been working on, but merge conflicts happen when you, when you're not like committing and pulling enough if you're working with someone else or if you're working by yourself on two different computers. The way I try to work with to prevent merge conflicts is kind of a defensive way. So just trying to commit and push and pull more often so that you encounter merge conflicts infrequently. And then when they do happen, reading the messages that, th that those pop-up windows show to try to get an understanding of what, what could have actually been going on. Mm -hmm.